Alaska. I'm alone except for my dog Kenai and we live in a dry cabin in the eastern side of Alaska. We've been here roughly 90 days and we moved from a major city in Colorado living a traditional life and after being here for the last three months I figured today's a good time to talk about my experiences and to give an honest review of what it's like to live in a dry cabin. So we're going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly and without any further ado let's get started. So one of the rooms that I've not shown you in previous videos is this room and you'll have to excuse the sound in here. It's pretty empty um, other than I've got some uh, things left behind by the previous owner stored in this room that I need to discard of. The reason this room is empty is because it leaks. So <laughs> This is the ceiling and you can see there's some water damage. And now that the temperatures have dropped, the ceiling in here is actually frozen over. That is ice that you're seeing. And the floor is what you're hearing creak underneath me. These tiles have popped up and they're breaking as I'm stepping on them. Um, and you can see that there's some water damage still over here on the floor. I have not cleaned this room, obviously, since moving in. I basically have just closed the door to this room and forgotten about it. So let's talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. As you can see, the room is pretty ugly in the current state that it's in, um, just because it's got old peel and stick tile. It's got a support beam going right up the middle of it. It's got a makeshift closet in here. So that's the ugly side of it. The bad side is, is that it has water damage, both top and bottom. But then the good side about this room is, is that I do plan on fixing this leak in the, in the roof as soon as I figure out how and why um, it's leaking. And I plan on turning this room into an Arctic entry. So in the cold months, basically that door will be my front door. And then um, this room, right now it has a propane heater, but it won't be heated once um, I turn this into the Arctic entry. This will basically just be the vestibule that will keep all the cold air in here and allow you to come in, take off your wet or snowy clothes, hang them in the closet, and then proceed into the cabin without allowing any of that snow or cold air to come in with you. It all just basically stay trapped in this room. This room is huge, by the way. I can't really get it all in in the camera. Maybe if I zoom out. Let me back up into this far corner here and just show you the room. The This room is 16 by 17. That's a huge closet. I may or may not leave it. I mean, it, it will serve its purpose, so I'll probably stay. And it's gonna make a great Arctic entry when it's all said and done. I have six four foot high by six foot across windows in the cabin, which just flood the cabin with natural light and beauty. I can walk by the windows at different times of the day and I'm just blown away by the view that I have out these windows. And I sit underneath these windows at night and I just watch the show that Mother Nature puts on. I watch all the stars go by and the moon rise. I can watch the Aurora Borealis, which is absolutely breathtaking, um, even to the naked eye, uh, because I swear that whoever invented ribbon candy must have lived in the Northern Hemisphere where they could see the Aurora Borealis because that's what it reminds me of as it dances through the sky. However, there's a bad side to these windows. The windows, they let in a lot of cold. So if you've been 
keeping a watchful eye of the background in some of my previous videos, you might have noticed some insulation in the windows. And basically what I have in the windows is some insul foam. It's two inches thick. I just cut them to size to fit into each one of the windows. I, now that the temperatures are starting to drop, for the last few weeks, we've been around negative 25 every single day. It's really cold outside. I mean, of course, right? I live in remote Alaska. I don't want that cold to come into the cabin. And so I just slip that into the windows, draw the curtains closed, and that does a fantastic job of holding out the cold and holding the heat in. But the ugly side is that I can't see out my windows because of that. And then this happens. It ices up on the inside of the window. I'm sure that that ice and thaw, you know, is an issue, but I'm not too concerned about it. And I know people would probably think, well, you should be. You're, as that thaws, it's going to cause rot in the walls. Even if I didn't insulate the windows, there would still be ice building up in these windows. It is just too cold here to not have the ice. So now you can see I've got the foam in the window, no more pretty view to look at, and I'm left with this. But let me just tell you that this does a fantastic job of blocking that cold. So while it might be ugly, it is very effective at doing its job. Now this other bad part about this is this wasn't cheap. They were very costly. I think I spent well over, I spent almost $600. Yeah, there's another good, bad, and ugly for you. But, you know, I do keep the curtains drawn, so I'm not looking necessarily at the foam once the curtains have been drawn closed. Which brings me to the next point. So the next thing is this door. This door is beautiful, don't get me wrong. Or at least the window is beautiful. I don't think the door itself is necessarily. And it's a composite door. So it doesn't do anything to hold out the cold, which is bad. And to be honest with you, if a bear wanted to get through this door, I don't think it would take him anything to do so. And that's also bad. Now the previous owners have told me that having a dog on the property will prevent bears from coming around. But this property has been vacant for a good number of years and the bears and the moose and the wolverines and the wolves and the coyotes have been using it as a super highway to go from the rivers that are run on either side of the cabin. And so until they become accustomed to the fact that there is a dog here, you know, they're gonna just keep coming through. And I'm a little bit concerned about what it's gonna be like in the spring when the grizzlies are hungry, they have young uh, cubs with them and they want in the cabin. Will this door stand up to them? I don't know. But my plan is to eventually replace this door because I think it's ugly. It does not fit the look of the cabin. And my plan is to replace this door with a solid wood door that is more fitting of the look of a remote cabin. So we'll see. The other thing is I know that like right now I can peek out this window to see the view outside, make sure that there isn't anything out there before I let Kenai out. But I plan on putting a window just to the other side of this. So if this window is gone because I replaced it with a solid wood door, that's no problem. Getting that window put in, that's a problem. So it'll be good to have that window because it'll allow me to have some ventilation because none of the other windows open up on this level. It'll allow me to have some ventilation in the kitchen area without having to have the door standing wide open. The bad part about that is, is like getting a contractor out here to put that window in. There's nobody in the area where I live that advertises their skills for construction work, at least not that I've seen. Now, maybe there are on some of the bulletin boards, um, you know, in neighboring communities, but I've not seen that so far. Before moving out here, I tried to get, you know, somebody to come out and give some estimates for some of the work that I knew the cabin needed and I could not get anybody to come out. So I'm still on the search for that. Hopefully I can make that happen. But getting that window put in would be a really good thing for the cabin. But like I said, the bad thing is, is finding somebody who can do it. And if I were to do it myself, it would be really ugly. So that's not going to happen. One of the things I forgot to mention is that the doors get covered by curtains 
to help hold in some of the heat that would otherwise be lost uh, through, you know, just the fact that it's a composite door that doesn't really hold out much. All right, on to the next thing, which is the roof. If you have seen in my previous videos, you might see that I have a um, rather unusual roof. And that brings me to the next part that I'm also going to need a contractor to help with. And that is this right here. So if you've seen my unwelcome visitor video, you might recognize this wall behind me. And if you haven't seen it, I'll link it up above and I'll put the link also in the description box below. But you might recognize this down here. And this is essentially a channel between the floor and the roof. And you can see there's foam of two different sorts um, on this wall. The darker foam is what's coating the roof and the lighter foam is, is spray foam to plug up some holes in the cabin. Since the rafters are made of just small timbers, they don't do an excellent job of holding everything in place. And, you know, they're, they've not been shaped or flattened on one side as they probably should have been. And so they've allowed the plywood then to sag in certain areas. The darker area that you see down here, this is actually closed cell foam. Um, and that is what my roof is made of. Essentially it's plywood and closed cell foam within a reflective coating on the top of it, a waterproof and reflective coating, even though the closed cell foam is really watertight it still does have an additional layer on top of it. You can see right here is one of those areas, and this is the closed cell foam coming in from the outside of the roof, such as the darker foam down here. You can see that there's been some water leakage here as well. It's not currently leaking, which is great, but I need to have a new roof put on the cabin. So I showed you the room that'll be the Arctic entry that has a major leak. I mean, it's basically a waterfall um, during the rainy months. I need to have the roof replaced in that room. I need to have the roof replaced in the cabin. And let me show you one other area where it's also leaking. So this room is a good thing. Even though when I originally thought of what I wanted in a cabin, drywall was not on my list of things that I wanted to see. I don't think it's aesthetically pleasing and it doesn't fit the cabin feel, but I am glad that this room has drywall. It's the only room in the cabin that has drywall. It essentially cordons off the loft and creates three separate rooms up here, which is a good thing uh, because it provides three distinct areas. The bad part is it's ugly. However, I'm not in here to talk about the ugliness of the drywall. What I'm in here to talk about is that this is my chimney running from the wood stove out the roof and it's another place where the roof is leaking. So, so here you can also see, you know, the plywood and the chimney stack and there is a lot of water damage on uh, the ceiling here. I have some containers down here on the floor to catch any drips. Um, Right now, it's too cold outside, as you saw from the Arctic entry room, for it to be leaking. But this is a big problem because the water is basically just pouring in from this opening. And when we had those torrential rains, these, these buckets were, were full. I had to keep dumping them because there was just so much water coming in um, from the leak. So... That's a really bad thing and it's ugly. I don't wanna to have to have pots of water or catchment systems in the cabin. So one more thing that needs to be remedied. So I'd mentioned previously that I'm very fortunate that the previous owners had installed drainage pipes that run out to a crib, a septic system, if you will, and a French drain for the gray water to drain away from inside the property to 
you know, out behind the cabin. That's all well and dandy, but in my opinion, that's not a good thing. That's actually a bad thing. And I say that because regardless of where you live, drainage pipes always back up. It might back up because they froze. It might back up because tree roots grow into them or because of something you're putting down the drain that causes that backup. And having to clean up from that mess is the most disgusting thing I can think of having to do within your own home. Just the bacterial load that that leaves behind, you're never gonna get that clean no matter how much you think you are, it's disgusting. And so my plan is to revert this cabin back to a dry cabin. And I know a lot of people, again, probably think I'm out of my mind for that because it will get down to negative 40, negative 50 here. And when it does, I know a lot of people can't imagine having to take buckets of, of nasty sink water and dump them on the property. But a few seconds of inconvenience is better to me than living with that viral bacterial load that a backed up sewage system might leave behind in your property. And one other thing is I don't have traditional flooring in this cabin. Um, nobody in this area, for the most part, has traditional flooring in their cabins. That's one thing about remote cabins is you can't afford to finish them out. So a lot of the things I'm saying here might sound like pipe dreams because who can afford it? So the floors in my cabin are rough plywood. The plywood is, you know, splintering. Had it been stained or sealed at one point, that has worn off. You can see where potentially maybe there was at one point some stain that was applied to the floor, but it has worn away and these floors are very porous to say the least. So if there was a water line break here, you know, sewage floors would suffer tremendously um, in a very short period of time. And so that again is a bad thing. The other thing is, as I said, you know, nobody in this area can afford to put in traditional flooring. And that is very true because there's no industry in this area. There's no work over here on this side of Alaska. So a lot of the people that here might have jobs seasonally or they typically just do uh, work from home, which doesn't pay a whole lot in most cases. And the average annual household income, I think is around $35,000 in this area. So it's not real high. The other ugly in this situation is the pipes, which are, running along and exposed and then they go to an insta hot um, that the previous owners had installed in the cabin i i assume it's really old i don't know how what the age of the insta hot is it would need servicing before i could use it and it would also require to bring in propane and that's an additional cost so right now we're talking about the fact that we have electricity to the cabin, wood heat for the cabin, oil heat for the cabin. Oh, let's talk about that, shall we? One of the other good things about the cabin is the wood stove. I love the wood stove. The wood stove has provided me not only with heat for the cabin, but a cook source as well. It's not a wood cook stove. It's just a typical wood stove meant for heating more than it is for cooking. But it does have a nice big flat surface on it so that I can bake on top of it or I can even cook bacon on top of it, what have you. I heat the water for the cabin on that wood stove. So the wood stove itself is a really good thing. It does a great job of heating the cabin. And I know that I've talked a lot about keeping the cabin at around roughly 50 to 55 degrees. And while that might seem cold to you, it is relative to where I live. It didn't take me very long to become acclimated to the temperatures um, in this area of Alaska. In the summer months, the highs here average between high 40s to low 60s. I don't really think that we'll even see 70s in the summer months. I could be wrong, but just going off of the data that I was able to find online. 
And when I first got here, it was averaging about 50 degrees outside and it felt really, really warm. 50 felt like an 80 or 90 degree day would in Colorado. And I'm not sure how to explain why 50 felt so much hotter than it, you know, would back in Colorado. But at 50 degrees in Colorado, you, most likely you're not walking around in a t-shirt and shorts, right? You're going to have on a longer sleeve shirt and you're going to maybe have on a jacket and what have you, though Coloradans are famous for walking around in our flip-flops in the snow. But I will tell you that here, 50 degrees feels really, really warm. And so for it to be 50 degrees in the cabin also feels really, really warm. When it's 55 in here, it's almost unbearable. It's kind of sweltering feeling. And one of the other things is, is that I do have backup heat. So while the wood stove doesn't get it super hot in the cabin, if I wanted to, I could get it super hot in here because just the other day I had my oil burner installed. So I had oil burners here on the property when I moved into the cabin. But again, because the cabin had been vacant for so long, those oil burners had not been functioning. There was one in the cellar below, which we'll talk about in a moment. And there was one on the main level. And as I showed you, there's a propane heater in the Arctic entry. However, or because the property set vacant for so long and those were left connected to the outside air source, they corroded and I had to have them fixed. So I only paid to have one fixed. The other one, I, I decided it wasn't worth it for me to do it. And it just got reinstalled the other day. And so I'll do a follow-up video where I talk about what it costs to heat the cabin with just wood compared to what it costs when I'm supplementing with that oil burner. Uh, but that'll have to wait because I haven't had it in the cabin long enough to get an estimate yet of what that cost is going to run. The beautiful thing or the good thing is, is that I do have the wood stove and I have backup heat thanks to that oil burner. The bad thing is, is that the oil burner itself takes two additional sources of heat to run. You know, the bad part is, is that now I'm using wood to heat the cabin. And if I use the oil burner, I'm using oil and electricity. And that's three types of fuel, electricity, oil, wood, to heat the cabin. I'm afraid that that utility bill when it comes in is gonna be ugly. I'll let you know in a future video what that really looks like and how much wood I'm really burning through to heat the cabin. Let's talk about the cellar. That is a really good thing that this ha cabin has. There aren't a whole lot of cabins in Alaska that have a cellar like this. This cellar is 30 by 30 feet and it is fabulous. However, the bad part about it is, is that they put in fiberglass insulation in the rafters and as you can see you know the rodents have just been from the squirrels and the shrews and mice and whatever else have just been burrowing and nesting in there and it's full of their droppings and that has got to go so it's ugly it's unsanitary and it's a bad thing in my opinion i'll be remedying that in the spring so that next winter i can use this as my root cellar. Right now, I cannot um, because I wouldn't put anything down here with the rodents being down here the way they are and having a place to nest. So once I eliminate their home, um, sweet home, and make it my home sweet home for my root vegetables and canned goods, that'll be a really good thing. Let's talk about the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of what it's like to live so remotely. The good thing for me is, is that it's really quiet. Where I lived previously, my neighbors were always within eye or earshot 
I couldn't go out my back door without feeling like I was in my neighbor's backyards as well. And here, because I back up to the national park and my nearest neighbors are miles away from me, that it's really quiet. And I don't have to worry about stepping into someone's barbecue by just going out my back door or my neighbor's dog barking at me because I opened up my back door. And so that's really a good thing. I, I love the solitude. I love the peace and the quiet that this cabin and this location has afforded me. But it has a bad side too. Recently, even though I didn't want to have to leave this area to go get something, you know, in these colder months, I did have to run into Anchorage and I had to drive, you know, roughly what, 300 miles along the Glen Highway for five hours. And the bad part about it is, is it was the day after Anchorage had gotten their biggest snowfall to date. Yes, to date. And that meant driving along rural highways that are not very well traversed um, from early morning through the snow and ice to get there. And I wound up staying the night in um, Wasilla because it was not safe for me to come back that same night. So that cost me two days. And the ugly part about that is, is it was additional money out of my pocket then to get a hotel room. <laughs> but the drive was beautiful. The scenery here is just over the top, breathtakingly beautiful. I am a nature lover, as you can probably imagine, but the scenery is breathtaking. And I'm very fortunate that I have all of this around me, regardless of where you go, it's, it's beautiful. Luckily, I was able to make it there and back safely. When you need to get something, it's there's nothing in this area. The nearest town from me is about an hour away. And no matter what you want, you're going to drive to get it. And that's just the ugly truth is that if you're not willing to drive to get to what you need, then you're going to do without for myself, that meant that when I moved here, I had to really stock up on provisions because I knew that, you know, once that snow is flying, I'm not going to want to make that drive back into town to get something. So while I was in Anchorage, I did take the time to hit up a couple grocery stores and just pick a couple extra things up that maybe I didn't get the last time I was there or that I've already burnt through. So that, you know, that's a good thing that I had that opportunity. I'm, I'm not complaining about that. Living remotely means that you have to make sacrifices. These things are not available to you. You know, when you live out here, there's no fast food. There's a small store in every little town that sells your normal convenience type foods, a loaf of bread, candy, soda, things like that. But it comes at a price. Living this far out, the gas is more expensive for your vehicle. The snacks are more expensive. It's costly to buy stuff out here. So, so I don't run into town to get uh, food and drink. I just don't do that. It just, it doesn't make sense to me to run to the, to the local market and buy those things. And if I wanna hit up an actual grocery store, that means that I am driving a very long distance to do so. The nearest grocery store from me that sells more than just your convenience foods, right? It's going to sell frozen meats and eggs and cheese and milk and things like that. That is over an hour away, one way. So that's a two hour round trip just to go to the store. And a hardware store is a little bit further than that. And the prices at that hardware store are astronomical. Um, so the cost of living alone out here is is greater. So you you make sacrifices in both your time and your wallet. And then, you know, what you get in return, though, is the beauty of the nature around you and the solitude that that affords you. So there is, you know, good and bad in all of this. I'm very fortunate that I was able to find this cabin. I love where I'm at. I you know, wake up every day with a smile on my face because this really is living the dream. And I'm going to leave you with those thoughts 
and then I will follow up in future videos, talk about what it costs to heat the cabin. And we'll talk about some of my future plans as, you know, they develop and I, you know, begin to put pen to paper and really get these things narrowed down as to what I'd like to do. I don't know where I'm going. I'm rambling.